right, how's everybody doing today? Welcome to day three, I guess day four, depending on how you count it, of DevOps. Um, my name is Yu Fang. I am a developer advocate at Google. And we're going to chill a little bit, see if any more people filter in. Feel free to move up. Lots of seats everywhere. <laughs> but thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to be talking about machine learning, how to scale it in the cloud to make it something that's useful uh, beyond just training for training's sake, right? Oh, I made a model. Um, so, so yeah. First, I want to make sure we're on the same page in terms of defining what is machine learning. So my super simplified version of what is machine learning is that it's using many examples to answer questions. That's it. I think that's got, got it down to five words. Right? It's, in all the long, different kinds of definitions I've seen, I think it's, it's up there on, on the shortest words, because I mean, I'm kind of running out of words to use. right? And in this quest, you, the important point here is that it needs to answer questions. You can have all the examples in the world, but if you're not using it to answer questions, and you're just training a model, then why are we doing it you know, at all? So that means there's two sides to machine learning. And both are equally important. On the training side is where we do all those examples, get all the data, clean it up, load it in, wait for it to train, wait for it to train, still waiting for it to train. And then we get to the prediction part. That's the fun stuff, right? That's where it's actually useful to your users. And so that's the answering question step. And you can do both of these steps on your local machine, right? You can train it, and then you can run a little command line, and then say, oh, look at that. My accuracy is awesome. It's over 95%. But then you still need to solve the problem after having gone through collecting the data, cleaning it up, loading it in, training, training, training. The last thing you want to be caught doing now is let's go figure out infrastructure, scaling, making an endpoint quotas. So go to the cloud. What if that could take care of that for us? So that's kind of the overall narrative that we're going to go through. Uh, we're going to use TensorFlow. I assume since I put it in the title that you guys at least have heard of the word at least once. And before we go on, I wanted to take a poll real quick. Show of hands, who has either run a red light or knows someone who has run a red light? All right, That's, so, so everybody who didn't raise their hand, look around. Okay. Now you've all known somebody who's run a red light. Great, so now that we're all in the same uh, ballpark of, of knowing people who have run red lights, have you ever thought about how they caught you when, you when you ran that red light? Some amount of you probably got away with it, right? But some of you, a couple days later, sitting around, check the mail, you, what is this from, from the State Department? Uh-oh. And of course, you got a traffic ticket. How did they catch you? Was there a traffic cop standing there on the corner saying, oh, there goes a car. Light's still green. There goes a car. Light's still green. All right, light's turning yellow. Someone's running for it. He's going to make it. Oh, he made it. Oh, this guy didn't make it. Now, let, me, let me use my eagle eyes, my legless eyes, and, and catch his license plate as he zips down the road and, and jot that down in my little notepad. Did that happen to anybody by any chance? <laughs> so traffic cameras are kind of like machine learning, right? They're, they're doing the things for us that are repetitive. They're, did, did we lose the, we lost traffic cops along the way, I suppose. But now they're doing more useful things, right? The computers are going through all these images, and they're figuring out <coughs> which ones are running red lights, getting the plates off of them. And you might have a human step down the road, right, to verify things, make sure the pictures are you know, being detected correctly. So that story aside, back to TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is a open source library for building graphs, computational graphs. It's particularly good at doing machine learning, but you can do it for other things as well. You can build these graphs to just do math, addition, multiplication, more complicated things too. And it's, at its core is C++ 
And over that is the execution engine of a cross-platform system that is still being added to more and more. And then distribution, and then over that is the various APIs. And the one we end up interacting with most is Python, right? But even that Python API is a low-level API. You're dealing with the individual nodes of a graph. You're saying, all right, put a five here, and then multiply with the input over here, and then link it together. So there's higher-level APIs built into TensorFlow. There's the Layers API that helps you build entire layers at a time, layers of your network. And then if you want to even go higher than that, you can build entire, basically entire networks at a time and just configure your training, all your different tuning variables, and you can choose like learning rate and optimizers and whatnot, right? And you can still go higher. We have canned estimators. So that will take care of choosing all those things for you too. And that's what we're going to focus on today because it's um, easy to use and it lets us focus on the actual story of scaling. So let's walk through the kind of canned estimator, this uh, algorithm that we're going to utilize today. Got a little story for you. It's almost as exciting as the traffic light one. So let's say you know, we're in Silicon Valley here. You, you're starting a hot new startup. You got a great idea. You're going to predict what people want to eat. They're going to type in chicken, and you're going to predict, oh, I know, you want chicken pasta, or you want chickens and waffle, right? And so you start out, and you say, I'm just going to launch it, right? It's, it's all good. I'm going to match what they say, just do word search. And well, as you might suspect, the results were less than spectacular, because sometimes they don't want just anything that has the word chicken in it. So then you go on to creating your V2. You create a linear model. A linear model is great for memorization. It's great for tying specific associations. And so your app is gaining some traction. It's doing pretty well. But your users are picky, right? It's memorizing. So every single time they say chicken, they are getting chicken and waffles because your training data happens to have a lot of chicken and waffles in it. So sometimes people say, I want some Italian food and they don't want spaghetti and meatballs every time. So you try to generalize. You say, ah, I know. I'm going to use a deep neural network because that's all the hotness right now. And what's great about a deep neural network is it helps you generalize. What it's doing is it is kind of casting your data, the data that it has, into a higher level, higher dimension space where it can say, shrimp fried rice and chicken fried rice are kind of similar in its own kind of space, right? So that's you know, eight, 16 dimensional space, your choice, really. And so you can see that there in the visualization. But no good deed goes unpunished. Sometimes they're too general. If you say you want, I can never remember this, an iced decaf latte with non-fat milk, then you want an iced decaf latte with non-fat milk. So you still need to be able to memorize a little bit and generalize. So we do both. This is a model known as wide and deep. It combines the ability to memorize with the ability to generalize. And this is, um, it was a paper that came out of Google Research and is kind of a decent starting point for any sort of structured data problem you have, because you can just drop in the pre-built model and just train it against your data. And because it both memorizes and generalizes, it's fairly robust. You have a selector at the top that basically chooses which side to go on depending on the data coming in on, on that prediction. So that's what we'll build today. So that's end story time. Our data set is just as exciting as building a food app it's census data. Yeah, OK. So we got about 32,000 training examples. And the task is to predict whether or not, given uh, various demographic data points, somebody will, has an income of over 50K, a household, household income over 50K. This was from the 1994 US Census. So we got columns like age and education and marital status. You got relationship, gender, capital gains, occupation, exactly the things you would expect to see. The point I want to uh, emphasize here is that we have both categorical data 
and continuous data. And so as a broad kind of division of those two, those two kind of have different treatments. If you have something that's continuous, let's say like capital gains, where it's just, it could be any real number, versus something where you have very distinct values, you know, 11th grade, 12th grade, college, you know, PhD, et cetera, or you know, single, married, divorced, widowed, then you, you have to treat those columns of data differently, those features differently. And finally, we have our last column, which is our income bracket of literally just, it's just a string that has the greater sign 50, zero, 50, zero k or less than equal 50 k. And so we'll that gets transformed into just a zero or one for predictions purposes. So zero will mean less than, one will be higher than. So back to our little architecture, pseudo architecture diagram. We have the training and the prediction. Because we only have only 32,000 rows of training data, it turns out that it can run on my laptop in a reasonably decent amount of time. And so what we're gonna do is just have that training happen locally. What's neat is that on the cloud side, you can take the output, that model that's trained, from your local machine and push it into the cloud. So we'll show you how to do that. And that, that's, that's the cool part, is that you can mix and match at your leisure. So I've got here a um, IPython notebook. For those of you guys not familiar with that, it's basically Python in a browser. And you can have these cells, which you can choose between Markdown and code. And you can run this code um, in the browser. So the first thing we'll do, we'll do some imports. We'll you know, make some arrays or lists of just the string names of the columns in our data. And we create a function here. I'm, I'm going to kind of move through this part. You don't need to um, get every detail here, mainly because like, the, the focus here is on scaling and training. So I'm just going to kind of walk through this. Um, the, this second piece here is defining a function that will map the CSV data to something that the model can understand. So it's, it's simply creating a, it, you know, it's called an input function, so it's literally just mapping those inputs for us. The next thing is creating feature columns. Now remember how I mentioned there were categorical columns and continuous columns. So when you have the categorical columns, in TensorFlow we, it's referred to as a sparse column versus a dense column for continuous. So for the sparse columns, what we're gonna do is we have two choices. If we know exactly the values in our data set that um, align with that column, in this particular case, the gender column happened to only have male and female as values, then we can define them directly. We can use sparse column with keys. And is this big enough for folks? I can make it bigger. Font is okay, you can see it? Cool, nod for yes. <laughs> And if you don't know or don't care to enumerate all the different string values of a column, then you can just let TensorFlow do it for you. So you do it with a hash bucket, and you can choose a hash size of based on what you expect the values to be, just so you don't have collisions. And so this saves the actual tensors. That's what these kind of wrapper functions do. They create just places for the data to flow through later. And so we'll, we'll combine these together in a moment. Let me just run this cell. And then we do the same thing with continuous columns. Continuous columns are straightforward. They're just real valued columns. That's all you do. And then we can also choose, if we wish, to do some transformations. We can combine some columns together. And you can also alter the columns a little. Some of the real valued columns, if you care to bucketize them, let's say age, Right, you say, you know, I actually would, I want the model to be aware of the fact that, you know, 18 to 25 is an age group I care about. Then 25 to 30, what I do, 30, is another age group. So you use this boundaries argument to do that. So that's also a nice little feature. So that turns your age, a continuous column, into bucketized age, which is categorical. So run that. Oh, and then we have these cross columns where you can combine two or more categorical columns into kind of a super column. And so if you know uh, ahead of time, for example, that education and occupation are probably related somehow, and you want to basically say this and this, then you can you know, kind of do that ahead of time. And again, we see that hash bucket size. So the intuition there is 
basically you can combine the, the, or, the uh, orders of magnitude of the two existing columns. So that's why some of these are bigger, bigger than others. And then, did I run this cell? I did. So then we can finally pull them all together. What we have here is all those variables from the wide column, just in a giant array, and you can see here we have the actual categorical columns up top, followed by age buckets, education, occupation. These are all our cross columns right below it. Then we have our deep columns, right? Because we had said we wanted the wide columns, and we have the deep columns. The deep columns, you need to do this embedding. We talked about how a deep neural network can kind of place things in this higher dimensional space to see what they're related to. That's what it's doing with categorical columns. So you see here we have all our categorical columns. Again, these are the same variables as we saw above in the wide column section. And then we can choose a dimensionality. This value is kind of something you can tweak. I'm choosing eight because I'm running on a MacBook and I don't want my CPU to blow up. So <clears throat> we do that and then finally we have these which are our continuous columns from earlier, those real valued columns. So combine them all together into one giant array. So now we have wide columns and deep columns. Okay, so we're ready. We've set up all the data. We've created all our columns. And I ran that cell, which is great. Creating a model with the higher level estimator, canned estimators, is super easy. It's, it's all up in this section, and I have, there's three going on here, and you can choose between them. So our wide and deep is at the bottom. It's a deep neural network linear combined classifier. But if you just want a linear classifier, that's there too. And the arguments are pretty much just the same thing, with the deep one requiring the hidden units, which are just how many nodes do you want per layer. So the number of values there is each layer. So in that highlighted bit, it's two layers. The first one has 100, and the second one has 50 nodes. And so when we combine them, you know, I happen to choose 100, 70, 50, 25. And the other arguments are literally the same. So this function just, it takes a string argument to specify which kind of model type to use, just to make it easy to, to rerun. And so, you know, if we were to say, let's create me a wide and deep model. So this creates us a model. But it doesn't train anything, right? It's just all that setup we did. All right, everything's set. The board is set. And then finally we can train it. The training is literally as simple as taking the variable we had, it was just m that we saved the model to, and doing m.fit. It's so short that it's easy to completely overlook it. So you have fit, it's gonna run 32,000 rows of input for 1,000 training steps. Uh, the batch size I happened to pick was 40 in this example. The data is local, but I also have it hosted in the cloud um, for downloading if you wish. Did I run the, yes, the notebook is running, okay. <laughs> I wanna make sure it is actually trying to do something. So this is done, great. So, see, this is why we didn't put it in the cloud. Because when you put it in the cloud, there are definitely uh, certain overheads. You gotta spin up your virtual machines, load in the library, load in the model. If you have multiple machines, you gotta do it for all of your machines, then network them together, then shard your data to each of them, and then hope that they come back with answers. So we did, well and deep, we did um, a little evaluation here, which is as simple as you expect, right? M.fit followed by M.evaluate. And once that's done, once we have a trained model, we run this little ditty to export it. This is um, fairly new um, code in terms of libraries. And there's kind of, this was a, a bit of a, a struggle to get working. But now that it's here, you can take it and, and use it. So a lot of it is reproducible um, or like easily translated to different use cases. So what we're doing is I have this um, little utility function that's just mapping the type between strings and floats. So some of the data are numbers, the continuous ones, and some of them are strings. In a lot of cases, those are kind of the only two data types you have, strings and numbers. Maybe you have ints also. And so I just had an array at the top that was, these are the categorical columns. So if the column is categorical, return the string type. And what this function does here, serving input function, the, the reason we need this is when we wanna save our model, for training in the cloud, the, the kind of final mile, the last mile that 
you have to solve, the problem you have to solve is mapping future inputs when your users are saying, hey, get me a prediction for this data. You need to map that to something that the model can accept. And that can sometimes be different from the functions you needed for training. Because in training, that input function that we wrote at the top, that pulls in your entire data set, figures out batching, and does the training loop. And it's essentially a generator that spits out data in large chunks. So this allows you to you basically define something very similar, but you have the flexibility to define something a little more, uh, something different if you wish. And so one argument is for a, the actual um, inputs into the graph, the, the tensors, and then the feature placeholders are the values as presented from kind of from the web. So let's say it's a JSON request, and then it converts to tensor, and then you can map it how you like. And then finally, there's just the export saved model. So again, you see that M making an appearance. So we did m.fit, we did m.evaluate. Finally, we can do m.export saved model. This outputs a file that looks, uh, let's see, where did I put it? I think, that, yeah, so we put it in exports. And of course, there's more than one file there. Okay, so it outputs something like this. It's a saved model.pb. PB stands for protobuffer. Um, basically, it's a compiled binary that, that represents the graph. And then we also have a variables uh, folder that contains the trained weights. And what we do is we literally can upload those. Um, you can literally upload your model directly to, well, this is a, my failed attempt the first time, but this one is the, the same folder that we're seeing, and it's just those files. It's just the saved PB, and if the internet will cooperate, that would be wonderful. Go. Okay, so this is tiny probably. Okay, so there you have it again, right, the saved model. So we put that in cloud storage. So this is Google Cloud Storage. It's just blob store in the web, in the cloud, and then what we can do is we can go to the Google Cloud Machine Learning Engine. It's a mouthful. You can just call it Cloud ML Engine or Cloud ML, and create a model. A model in this kind of system is simply a wrapper for versions. Versions are what are interesting, because that means it, what it is is a version is the actual model. And models is just a wrapper to help you group them together. Probably could have come up with better names there. But so we can create a model. Let's say we just create one for, for now just to show you. So DevOps, and we create, so literally creating a model, all you need to do is supply a string name of your choosing. So that just creates a model. But of course, there's nothing there, right? All I did was enter a string. That's not going to do us any good. So what you want to do right, is go into your model and create actual versions. So when you create a version, let's go to this one, you give it a name, a version name. So you could say, you know, v1 or v0.0.1 .0 because you're really, really not sure. So version names should start with a letter, and apparently you can't use dots. So let's just call it that. And then you give it that path to the folder that we had before, something like that. So you could either browse for that, or I think I need GS. And random tip here, because this tripped me up really bad <laughs> when I first did this, you need the final slash. And if I would paste it correctly, that would be great. But you do need the final slash. So what I found out was when I clicked through the UI, I was like, da 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 da. And then it's like, oh, this one. And then it's like, hmm, there's a slash. So you need that slash. If I delete the slash, it will complain. If I add the slash, it will work. And this is what I get for turning on dictionaries. OK. So put the slash in. And then you can cl click create. So now it's, now it's actually putting in a model, right? And that's a, an operation. Right? So there's a whole, if, I, if we go back to the one I already had in place, um, there's a whole list of operations here, right? Creating models and whatnot. Then you can look at the details of that, and you can see 
for example, if I said, oh, I want to create another version that points to the same folder, then I can go here and, and pull that out. Right? We have that, that location again. Um, it should be uh, noted, however, that the folder is not where it's reading from when it's serving. You're doing that when you create it, and it's going to copy it out. So you can delete it. You can put other stuff in there. It's not going to automatically pick that up. You want to do a new deployment. So this way, you know, it, it's kind of Pythonic in that way, right? You tell it exactly what you want, and it doesn't do unexpected behavior. So I guess the the moment we've all been waiting for is, is actually seeing it do a prediction. <laughs> so uh, if I can go past all the LLs that we did, doing a prediction. Uh, what we had was there's a census.json. You can see it's you know, reasonably responsive. Um, this is doing two requests at once. It's doing two predictions. You could, of course, just have one at a time. And there's a REST API that this command line tool is calling. But this is like a useful tool for development. Um, what did I have here? So we talked about model creation. Yeah, so this is kind of the way you would represent the inputs. It's Kind of similar to a CSV, but you know it's, it's the JSON version of that. And this, these are the, the two that we put in. And then so when I ran that, this is, this is kind of what we see over here. But this is bigger. You get back a couple of different values. Um, in the API form, it would come back as JSON. And so you get the actual logistic value. So these are the values that correspond to this column on the right. And then you can see that the probability is this first one would basically be predicting it's the zero, right? It's the zeroth value, and this one's predicting it would be the one position, index one. And so that's why these values here are zero and one. Maybe I'll flip them next time so it's not looking like it's an ordering or a list of indexes, but it's actually, if I had more, it would just be like zero, one, one, zero, one, zero. And you can do batch prediction as well. Um, I'm not going to do a batch prediction live here because batch prediction is really meant for when you have larger batches of data. Not two or 200, but maybe like 1,000 or more. Because when you do that, it really shows up as a job. And that incurs with it all those spin-up costs. It spins up multiple workers, loads up your model in all of them, as well as the necessary libraries. And then it shards the data across them. And then it runs the model, predicts, and then it comes back together again. And uh, the, the UI for this is kind of neat in that you know, you're not stuck on the command line the whole time. Once you've executed the job, you can go in and you can see some details about it. And they have a link that go, takes you directly to the logs. So, so that's always nice to, you know, just to keep tabs on things. And oh, yes. And with batch prediction, you get a file back or files back rather than just on the command line. So with instances, we just said, predict me this. OK. Predict me that. OK, got it. With batch prediction, it's really thought of as a job. It's maybe something you run once or twice a day. And then you can have these results. They just put them back into cloud storage for you at a location of your choosing. And let's see. This is the JSON version if you did instance. So it's the, the same exact thing as you'd expect. And earlier, I talked about how we did this kind of model where we trained on the local machine and then we did our prediction in the cloud. And that we have the, basically this model, this saved model.pb file, which is being used as the intermediary. And because TensorFlow is open source, you can basically load it to wherever you want. And you can kind of flip and swap them as you wish. Which means you could also, if you wanted, train in the cloud. Let's say you had actually had a massive data set and you had a long running training that you wanted to run. So you can flip these. Now, why would you want to flip them? The reason is because on the prediction side, maybe we could replace this laptop with a phone. You could have a trained model deployed in a mobile app, for instance, that is running locally on a device, rather than having that device call out to a prediction API if you wanted. Or you could do both. So you could certainly have a fully cloud on both ends, but you have the optionality to design it differently if you want, because you have this intermediary model between training and prediction. And so I think th this kind of realization helped me understand a little bit more about like how you can leverage this architecture a little more. And, and it's a lot more flexible than perhaps 
it, it looks at first because it's like, oh, put it in the cloud. Like, oh no, now all my stuff is in the cloud. But if you wanted to train locally because your data was sensitive and you don't want to upload it to something, I understand that, right? Or if you had a GPU farm at home in your basement for some reason and you did all the training in, in there and then you said, gosh, my, my startup is really taking off. I can't, I don't want to also spin up an entire data center and, and host this myself or even like get a bunch of VMs, write the co wrapper code to wrap the model, to serve it, write the you know, API gateway and things like that, then just throw the model over the fence and it works, Ray. So thank you for coming. I think we're sort of running out of time. I don't, I don't know how the schedule thing is, is playing out. Um, it's, they're late, so yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe we can save some time for, for questions or if there's anything you want to see in more detail, especially in that code run through that we kind of glossed over. I'm happy to do that. I know it's kind of a quiet day, but we have a question. Awesome. Exactly. Right. So, so the API is, is also, um, it's a REST API, yeah. It's a good question. So the question is around using the prediction service for your model for images, because everyone likes to predict whether or not there's a kitty in their picture. So with images, what you would do is you would base64 encode it, and so that, the, the request would then just be a serialized string. And what that would mean, though, is in terms of thinking about um, your data, right, and, and how that's being fed into the model. Your model needs to know how to read that through properly. So that, that would be a fun example to work through as well. So thank you for that. Other questions? Yes? So the question is around the size of the data set versus the size of the model created. The data set really dictates how long it takes to train a model. The model itself, you can think of it as there's some um, description of the architecture of the model, of like, okay, here are all the places where, um, you know, this is the structure of it, the data flows through this way. And then the weights define, you know, the various multiplications and additions and whatnot that happen in that model. But how much data you pour through and the training that happens that updates those weights inside, it's still the same structure with the same number of weights. Those don't change no matter how much data you put into it. So that output model is entirely dependent on the architecture of the model itself, not the data that is fed in, um, the amount of data that is fed in. Right? So some models are quite large. Um, one example, if if you're familiar with the Inception model, which is Google's kind of vision, the wide vision uh, model, that trains on the scale of about 84 megabytes when it's done. The, the, all, when it's all said and done, like in terms of the total size of the model file and the weights. Now, um, I actually gave a talk about this at Google Cloud Next, was that two weeks ago? Specifically on training the cloud and putting it on, on mobile, and there are ways to compress it down to about a fourth of that. So now we're talking about 20 megabytes for what is a really large and sophisticated model. So it's kind of an upper pound. Um, and, and those techniques revolve around turning your weights into kind of quantized values. So instead of having one, a 0 0.1153 and 0 0.1154, maybe those are the same value. Right? So, so it turns your graph a little fuzzier, but by having lots of values essentially be the same, it allows it to compress. So it turns the, the specifically it turns the 32-bit floating point numbers to 8-bit floating point numbers. And um, you don't lose too much accuracy, amazingly enough. That, that's the, the unexpected result. It's because neural networks are designed for fuzzy inputs in the first place. So you can get, a, get, a, get away with it, which is nice. Cool. Other questions? Yeah, so, so what we saw, the first the question around fast predictions, right? Because you know, you're kind of handing over your model and, and hoping that it works. And so we saw, I mean, it, now it's warmed up, but the first time we ran it, I, I, you know, the entire talk, I didn't run any predictions, right? So everything is spun down to essentially zero and over Wi-Fi, and then it, it comes up. 
because this is, you can think of it as running on one worker node, right? So the, the model is kind of warm, the node is kind of warm, and as long as you get some request every few minutes, it'll stay warm. And as you get more, it'll actually scale up for you. And there, there are also ways to manually set it, but with manual, um, if you set the number manually, it won't scale. It'll just hold it there. So if you get you know, a ton of traffic, it's not going to go anywhere. But it also means that you kind of are reserving yourself a number of workers. But in general, and especially when you're starting out, using the automatic scaling seems to work fine. Um, yeah. So that, that's one of the things I, I, I want to, I'm in the process of making is something to kind of load test this and then give it, give it a run for its money, right? And just start throw, throwing requests at it all day long and, and seeing, seeing how, how hard it can uh, get hit. Yeah. So the question is around whether or not there's an overhead incurred when loading a model into a mobile device. So with um, both Android and iOS, and I guess also Raspberry Pi, there's kind of dedicated runtimes for each that are also kind of compressed down. And then when you, you would package it into an app. So it would be loaded at app load time. So then it would just always be there. It wouldn't be every time you needed to make a request, it would be there. I mean, you could, you could write the code however you want. Um, the one that I, I did in, in my talk was a kind of a camera scanner, and I, I trained it to recognize different kinds of um, peanut butter cups, like candy, as well as like one stick of gum randomly, just to, for variety. <laughs> um, but it could like recognize like Reese's cups, and like it was like Justin's peanut butter cups, and like milk chocolate versus white chocolate, just like the packaging, right? Um, but yeah, that, that was a fun little thing. But it's a scanner, right? So it's continuously, I think I was having a poll once every second. So it's, it looks like a camera app, but then there's an overlay that displays what it, what it does. I'll probably add a link to the slides <laughs> since it sounds like it's a point of interest. Anybody else? One more. Okay. Ah, yes. The pricing. Um, I am no sales rep, so, oh yeah, also just for side thing, um, with the output model, where did it go? Okay, the files, like when I said like in the make the, the batch ones dump files out. Like, it's just a text file with the values in it. So it's not something crazy. Just wanted to let you guys know that. Okay. Let's do, yeah, let's go to Google Cloud's machine learning homepage. Oops. Pricing. Yay, pricing. So this is for training. Uh, this top portion, and there's different tiers for the training portion because you can, the basic tier is literally just one kind of machine. And what's also worth pointing out is you can train locally, right? When you're just developing, you should train locally. If you have a huge data set, you should make a accurate kind of some, some representative sample, put it on your local machine, and train locally because you're trying to get your code working. You don't want to be pushing your code up and then waiting and waiting and waiting and it comes back and it's like, oh, the library couldn't be found that you wanted to use. It's like, great. It's like, oh, syntax error. You, you indented wrong. It's like, no, you don't, you don't need to be, you know, the development cycle should be fast. So that you should do locally. And then when you're ready to go to the cloud, then you can do your whole data set or half your data set and you can maybe start playing with different um, tiers of compute. So the standard tier and premium tier, the reason why they look so expensive um, I think standard is something on the order of four, um, four 16 core CPUs all wired together. Um, and then premium is, I believe, oh no, it's 10 and 100, I think, is it? But we, we can look at the <laughs> details. It's a bunch. Um, and then the basic one is just one. And then there's also the GPU tier where there's a K80 attached to the. And then on the prediction side, what's neat is like, like I, I think maybe this is the side you're wondering about. I guess both are interesting. Um, between zero and 100 million requests per month, it's 10 cents per thousand uh, requests. And you know, that includes all the auto scaling and stuff. And then plus 40 cents 
per node hour. So that's like if you're just like running it a whole bunch, like each little snippet kind of adds up. So that's kind of the pricing story. Yeah. So the question is around whether or not this 40 cents is in addition to the node that you have running. Um, so you know how I, when I made a request, I just did it and then it just came back, right? That's not your node. I didn't spin up a virtual machine in Google Compute Engine and say, run it here for me. Um, it's, it's more similar to like App Engine or something like that, where that, that just like handles all of the infrastructure under the hood for you. Because all I did was provide it a file or a folder with files in it. And so this is actually just, it's 40 cents per node hour. And it's not saying like, whoa, you did one request. That's one hour, right? It's, it's per little snippet billing. And then so, um, yeah. So let's see, multi-part question here. The, the basic GPU tier is one uh, machine with a NVIDIA K80 attached to it right now. Um, we're working on getting other types of GPUs in as well. And then with the other t tiers, especially the, the more kind of quote unquote expensive ones, you can, it, it's just the CPU. But uh, if you wanted to do networked distributed, which is using distributed TensorFlow, yep, you can use this custom configuration. And so there you can choose, I would like 33 CPUs, please. Like, um, and I would like half of them to have GPUs and the other half not. It's, it's literally just whatever you can dream up, we can do it for you. Um, these are basically just aliases you can think of as like, oh, if you just want to you know, pick one of these, you, you don't really want to think about that. Like you can, but if you, if you want to pick something specific, by all means. Um, I'm going to jump to the actual pricing page because you guys have lots of questions about it. <laughs> Speaking of lots of questions about it, other questions about it or anything else? All right, well, if there's no other questions, um, I have TensorFlow stickers up here for your laptops if you want. Um, if you have other questions that you want to follow up with, feel free to swing by. And um, yeah, happy to get in touch. So thank you again for for coming. Um, I can chat with you more about pricing after. <laughs> <laughs>